Hello, welcome to Kashkov TV. My name is Kaylin Ashkoff. Thanks for watching another video on history of leaders of thought. Today we will be doing uh, Marcus Aurelius and Plotinus. So, uh, firstly, I just want to preface this by I know you might have noticed that some of my formatting on the dates seems a little strange, particularly the last video where it crossed over from AD to BC. So, it's actually common practice for BCs to put the BC after the number. Whereas AD, the AD comes before the number, so it's not me just messing it up and getting things confused. This is actually quite intentional. So nonetheless, I just wanted to preface with that. So Marcus Aurelius, I'm sure you've heard, I'm I'm not sure when you're watching this, but you've probably heard of the movie Gladiator. Marcus Aurelius does show his face for a little bit, or obviously not his real face, but the actor portrays Marcus Aurelius and pretty pretty representative of his actual character and sort of his stoic philosophy. He's most famous for his book called Meditations. A lot of individuals, especially those who are not even too familiar with philosophy, are they know the book Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. It's kind of in terms of structure, I would say most similar to something from uh, Confucius or Taoism, like Lao Tzu or something like that in that in the sense, or the, the art of war, for example, Sun Tzu, in that there are a bunch of little quotes. And personally, I don't think it's the best way of representing a philosophy because I think when you when you try to put things in two small quotes I think you can sort of the meaning can be skewed and sometimes it can be too one-sided we'll see that later but there's also a lot of great material in here and it's kind of he's one of the exceptions he's the only real um, Roman emperor who could also be considered a philosopher so obviously a great achievement there and in Plato's Republic that's sort of what he advocates he advocates for the philosopher ruler so that's sort of exactly what Marcus Aurelius is so as he's was considered the last of the five good emperors so if you've seen the movie Gladiator or if you just know the history app following him Commodus becomes emperor and he sort of um, messes up this period of peace. There was also, he's the last of Pax Romana, which was a period of peace. So perhaps maybe a criticism would be that although he was very good in his own lifetime, maybe he did not do the best job in securing the future for Rome. So we can talk about that in a little bit. But uh, he was the son of a praetor named Marcus Verus III and a wealthy wealthy heiress named Domita, Domitia Lucilia, the Lucilla. So um, basically they inherited, well, through his mother's side, a bunch of brick, um, brick-making facilities outside of Italy, or just in the Roman region. And since there was a huge economic boom and a lot of development going on in Rome, obviously being having a brick factory was obviously a very, very good business at the time. So obviously very wealthy but he didn't he, it uh, younger in his life it wasn't expected that he would become roman empire and he, he ended up sort of the role got thrust upon him but we'll see more about that very soon so eventually he gets adopted by antonius pius who becomes the emperor and that sort of puts him into the role and i'll explain that more in detail in terms of his teachers he had herodes Atticus, Marcus, uh, Marcus Cornelius, and most uh, most importantly, Marcus Cornelius Fronto, who they ha had a sort of very affectionate relationship, and I'll get more into that as well. He's also most notable for his uh, involvement in two very important wars in Roman history, those fought against Parthia, the Empire of Parthia, and the Kingdom of Armenia, which was formerly part of the Roman Empire, and he also defeated the Marcomanni, the Quadi, and the Sermantia Iazigis. So basically the macro, no, macromanic wars, which were the, the Germans invading from, uh, the Germanic tribes sort of inv invading the northern regions, the Roman Empire. So he kind of put that struggle to rest. Well, not directly as we'll see, but he, maybe sort of in terms of moral influence. But nonetheless, so most of the history we have about him is from what's called Historia Augusta, which was actually produced in three. They would say 395 A.D. It was thought at first that there was a it was a compilation of a bunch of different writers, but then people have kind of thought that maybe it was just one writer too. So a couple issues here. Firstly, 
It's 400 AD is way past Marcus Aurelius' lifetime, so whoever the writer was, if there were one or were many, they obviously didn't know Marcus Aurelius. And secondly, if it was just one writer, even though there are some great historians, such as Plutarch, who I would say is the greatest historian of all time, they, just one person obviously can miss things and obviously have a lot of bias. So, also the the biographies of Hadrian could be used as good sources for Marcus Aurelius, especially his secession into power. But also, most notably, in terms of his philosophy, the main source would be Meditations. An interesting point about Meditations was it was actually not written to be read by people, so what, it didn't even have a name. So Meditations is actually just a Greek word meaning sort of to myself. So the book could also be called To Myself. But nonetheless, he was, he was as mentioned before, he was born. His original name was Marcus Aeneas Verus. And he goes uh, typical of Romans who um, sort of move throughout the latter. He eventually adopted the name Marcus Aelius Aurelius Verus Caesar or Marcus Aelius Aurelius Verus Augustus even later. So obviously his name just kept getting packed up. But for ease of um, communication, I'm just going to refer to him as Marcus Aurelius for the course of this video, independent of the time of which I'm speaking of him. So his supposedly on his father's side he was a descendant of Numa Pompilius. So Numa Pompilius was the second um, leader of Rome. So after Romulus and Remus, and I think this is an important note because obviously it could be just um, uh, it could be fictitious that they were related, but I think in terms of character they were very similar. Numa Pompilius. He was less concerned with warfare and creating a powerful state, but he was more he was very concerned with incorporating religious rights and sort of community and that is something that I think Marcus Aurelius would have understood and supported so and also temperament wise they were both sort of um, even though stoicism came long after Numa Papilius I think Numa Papilius could um, be well at least his actions conform with stoic beliefs so as mentioned he inherited these brickworks through his mother's side during the construction boom so he obviously was very very rich his great grandfather was a senator and an ex praetor his grandfather was a patrician um but his father um was also um during his was a praetor as well which obviously isn't even the highest rank a normal civilian can get so um not only did marcus aurelius not come from direct blood emperor blood he, his father was not an, um, an emperor. His his real father was um, not particularly exceptional. But either way, he was part of the equestrian order, so that means he had access to horses and such like that. He was, I guess you could call him a knight, but his father died at three years old, but when Marcus Aurelius was three years old. Um, but nonetheless, Marcus Aurelius says that he still learned about modesty and manliness posthumously from his father. So from stories he had heard, he had heard about the honor of being, I don't know, manly, but also modest. So so nonetheless, he grew up on what's called the Kalian Hill, and he really adored this place. He called it My Kalian, like his home taste, um, town. Basically, it was like, an up, like a very upscale neighborhood. He lived right next to the uh, Lateran, which ultimately became the Popal Residency. So, very wealthy area. There was It was actually not too populated, but it was just a bunch of estates. So, think of him living in, I don't know, something like a Beverly Hills or something like that. Um, he grew up with uh, his grandfather, who instilled him to have good character and avoid bad temper. But he was homeschooled which was, I guess, kind of kind of uncommon at the time. Most Romans, even wealthy Romans, would get this sort of public education, but he was homeschooled. And um, by one of his teachers, Diognetus, who was his painting teacher, he actually got into philosophy, ultimately, who was um, into Stoicism. He would, and since, since he got so passionate about sort of philosophy and stoicism, he would practice his philosophy in like a dirty and ugly and hard, uncomfortable robe, sort of in the classical style. 
and additionally he would sleep on the floor and eventually his mother told him to stop sleeping on the floor and he eventually returned to his bed but that's just kind of some a little anecdote about his character he also studied homer which i think is an absolute necessity for anyone who's interested in the classics obviously it's just a big piece of literature but i i think it it tells about sort of the, the morals and the values of not just people of the time but i think everyone everywhere i think everyone to some extent wants some sort of greatness and to some extent wants to have their story heard and some sort of um immortality through their actions but either way he was and he was also educated in latin he actually all of his meditations despite originally growing up in rome he wrote it all in greek so he really loved the culture and he was really passionate about that so ultimately how did he become emperor so hadrian was a former emperor and he he was starting to get sick and he uh first has this uh individual his one of his sons lucius Saonius Commodus, which is not the Commodus we'll be speaking of later, but he, this individual is so sick, he, when he's becoming emperor, he literally, he can't even lift the shield to get, um, to become emperor, so ultimately he becomes too sick and then doesn't, has to give it up, um, I think he even dies, so he passes it on to, um, Aurelius Antonius, so, and Aurelius Antonius adopts both Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Commodus. Um, and these two individuals are both sort of being, I guess, groomed to be emperor. But I think Marcus is sort of the favorite in that, you know, he didn't even come from this family. He was kind of just chosen to be um, adopted and be brought up to ultimately become emperor. Actually, ultimately, for the first time, these two individuals, um, ultimately they call him Lucius Verus, which is different from the Lucius Verus we'll also be talking about. So sorry about that these names are getting um, confusing because they all are very similar. But um, they ultimately for the f have, for the first time in Roman history, t uh, two emperor system, where there's two emperors of Rome simultaneously. But in all intents and purposes, Marcus Aurelius had almost all the power. So with this, before he becomes emperor as, he, as the adopted son of Aurelius Antonius, or um, he gets the role of consul. But um, Hadrian ultimately tries to commit su suicide because Hadrian is getting very sick, and Antonius is sort of firstly prevents the suicide, but he also is the grantor of the will, and he also takes on these adopted children. So Antonius ultimately gets re referred to as Antonius the Pious. So, but Antonius Pius was actually very different from Marcus Aurelius in that Antonius Pius was very into athletics. He loved the gladiators. He loved the athletics and that sort of thing, whereas Marcus Aurelius wasn't even that interested in it. So I think the twofold for, for um, Antonius the Pius to have seen something in Marcus Aurelius that was different and still admire it, I think is all the more power to Marcus Aurelius but also I think it's indicative of Antonius the Pius's respect for Hadrian who Hadrian kind of picked out Marcus as sort of one who should be in line to become emperor so it's kind of a kind of nice because when you think about Roman politics you think everyone would just want their own children to have the power but really these people actually and this is why it was such an era of peace and they were considered the good emperors is that they actually cared about the best interests of the of the state of the empire and they wanted the best candidate to get it even if they did not share blood so he also similar to his father marcus aurelius becomes head of the cavalry for a bit and i don't think he was particularly good at it because obviously there aren't too many stories and when wartime comes he's actually not at the front lines but that's also because he gets older but the most famous statue and this is actually a replica the real statue is actually in the the museum but this is a statue a very famous statue of marcus aurelius on a horse and here's another very famous column by of marcus aurelius these both can be found in rome so two of the most important sites to view so eventually so he gets this title marcus alias aurelius verus Agat caesar and he he's very worried because firstly he thinks he does have a moral duty to 
um, respect Hadrian's intentions and a moral duty to respect Antonius the Pious and do a good job as ultimately becoming emperor. But once he takes his title, he says, See that you do not turn to Caesar. Do not be dipped in purple dye. For that, for that can happen, he says. So basically, he's worried that the power that he gets will turn him into a Caesar and make him corrupt. Um, Caesar, when I say Caesar, I mean specifically Julius Caesar. He, he, Julius Caesar was sort of represented by the color purple. But um, it's just sort of... I guess th that's why Marcus Aurelius was fit for the role, is that he didn't even want it. So that made him a perfect, perfect candidate. So with that, he... He gets, uh, supposedly joins all the priestly colleges, so that's kind of a, just a way of winning the respect of the people, and, but he's forced to live in House Tiberius, which is pretty much the royal palace for the, or the imperial palace for the Roman Empire, and he, on the palant, he sort of hated it, and he had to learn the pomp of court, and he had to sort of act in a way that did not conform to his own philosophy, but he played the role because he felt he had to. He felt it was his moral obligation. He has this quote, Where life is possible, then it is possible to live in the right life. Life is possible in a palace, so it is possible to live a right life in a palace. So he thinks that this is where Stoicism is kind of different from Cynicism. In Cyni Cynicism, you know, the most famous is Crites, who lives in an urn and literally um, wears rags, and he thinks it's, it's morally a crime to have any sort of wealth or power. But in Stoicism, you can have wealth, you can have power. Uh, Seneca achieved quite a bit of power, and um, it's still you can still be Stoic. You just kind of you can have it, but you just can't want it. You can't enjoy it or get fulfillment from it. And I think the f the truth is that they don't actually get fulfillment from it. I think Marcus Aurelius, despite having all this power just kind of given to him, he didn't really want it and he didn't really it didn't it wasn't what made him happy what made him happy was the philosophy which he delved into sort of as his own medicine as a lot of a lot of these philosophers are were depressives but they treated and uh, philosophy so obsessively because it was their medicine it was their salvation so as mentioned he wrote all of this in greek to to demonstrate his passion and he studied under the second sophist sophistic movement um, which was a very common, a uh, very popular uh, movement during Nero's time, where they sort of expanded the Greek alphabet into Rome, which really um, enhanced their ability to uh, understand philosophy. So, I guess the two main teachers I'll mention are firstly Atticus. So, Atticus was originally from Athens at the time when Athens was included in the Roman Empire, but he was really disliked in Athens, but he was super rich. It said he was definitely the richest guy in Athens, but he was probably the richest guy in all of the Eastern Empire. But um, he did not um, appreciate Stoicism. He did not like Stoicism. He thought that the lack of feeling was foolish, and it caused people to be sluggish and um, just um, like not harvesting life, like not really getting everything out of it. So this is obviously something that Marcus Aurelius doesn't believe, but it's he still respected the individual. So I think that is um, a very admirable trait to disagree with someone, but still admire them as a teacher. And it's also important for him to get both sides of it because his other teacher, Fronto, who is considered very much like Cicero is in, in terms of the top rhetoric, uh, individual uh, re rhetoric in Rome, and he completely disagreed with Atticus because he was more into Stoicism. But, you know, Marcus Aurelius was strangely affectionate with this guy. I'll give you a quote here. Farewell, my Fronto, wherever you are, my most sweet love and delight. How is it between you and me? I love you and you are not here in their correspondence. So they, they both had wives. Um, Marcus Aurelius had to marry the daughter of, of the pious, of... Uh, Antonius the Pious, so he had a wife, and he ultimately had 13 children around this time. He had a, um, he had two twins, and both his twins died, so his second and his third sons died. And Fronto also had a family, too, and they, they had spent a lot of time, but it's strangely affectionate, their, their writings. So. But nonetheless, Fronto and Atticus were always clashing because their philosophies just, um, just sort of contrasted each other. 
but Marcus Aurelius sort of found a way to unite them. So it's, it's nice to see that although Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic, he wasn't extremely polar, and he saw merit in everyone's ideas and wanted to unite people, and I think that is the epitome of Stoicism. He was always, so at this time, he was sort of pursuing mostly legal roles, so he was kind of like, he was essentially a lawyer, but he hated, he hated the role, and he sort of started getting an interest in it. He was very good at it, but he, he really had more of a passion for philosophy, so he would spend most of his time doing that. So at 147 AD, when he was about 26 years old, he has this daughter, and she's very sickly, he mentions, but he gets given imperium, which is authority over the armies and provinces of the empire. He also gets some tribunal powers. He gets to promote one measure in front of the Senate, whereas Antonius the Pious still retained four. But essentially, at 26, he's already getting these huge responsibilities, and a lot of individuals, such as... Um, Aristotle explicitly says that one should not go into politics before the age of 30, but to go in before, one needs exceptional talent. That's actually a reference from Adolf Hitler, he said that. But nonetheless, he gets in politics before, so obviously a sign of exceptional talent. I also could be seeing Alexander the Great got into politics very young, and he did obviously a very good job. So, But also I think that Antonius the Pious was just trying to groom him. Unlike any other of the emperors, when he actually assumed the role of emperor, he actually had strong legal grounding, which made him quite exceptional in terms of internal affairs. So Antonius eventually passes away, obviously, at around the age of 70, pretty old, and he has the longest reign since Augustus, so he beats Tiberius just by a few months. And as mentioned, it was very different from Marcus Aurelius in terms of them having different passions, but they got along and his final his final line on his deathbed and he uses it as a path as as a path password is equanimity which is essentially mental calmness which i think at the end of the day despite their sort of differences one being really into gladiators and violence whereas the other sort of a more recluse and introspective person they both believed in this sort of mental calmness and they might have derived it from different people but i think that's sort of what connected the two ultimately so he felt it with this him and lucius Verus become the two emperors of rome essentially marcus aurelius with all the powers um he obviously didn't like this role but he felt it was his duty to hadrian and antonius to do the job as the best of his abilities um, so one of the first things he does when he, you, you swear in as emperor of Rome, you have to give what's called a donative to the army. He actually doubled the normal donative and gave 20,000 sestras per, um, per person and fi or the equivalent of 5,000 denarii at the same time. And this is strange because it was a relative time of peace. So why is he paying the army so much? Um, maybe it was a sort of just a, a way of spreading wealth. But at the same time, he actually devalues the currency. So the silver purity went down to from 83.3% to 79%. So less silver per um, coin as a proportion of the whole. So what this did was this devalued currency. So I don't think this was done in terms of today. You might devalue the currency to increase inflation, which might make exports easy. Um, you know, there's the common um, GDP equation c plus i plus g plus x minus m so if you increase exports you're going to increase gdp but you know i don't think that obviously exports were important for the roman empire but relatively speaking the the roman empire was the strongest economy so increasing exports is going to only marginally impact gdp i think the reason he actually decreased the purity um, was just to get more currency in circulation because if you, as they were expanding the empire and also moving the Silk Road was starting up and they were trading starting in, in Asia and such, they just needed more currency. So I think there was a, a, le, a less of a modern economic reason, but more of a just a practical reason. There was a finite amount of silver. So if you decrease the amount of uh, the proportion of silver by um, 4.3%, then you can have quite a bit more currency. So I think that's why he actually did it. 
but um, nonetheless, him and Lucius Ferris were very popular with people, particularly him, because they were not very pompous like uh, former emperors they'd seen. And uh, a couple um, anecdotes, in about 161 or 162 there was a flood, the Tiber River flowed over and a lot of livestock died and they, the, out of the Roman coffers they paid the Italians and subsidized that. So that was just a way that showing that the central government was uh, appreciative of all the people and was willing to uh, give out helping hands and not keep the wealth to itself. And I think this is just because Marcus Aurelius really had no intention of keeping any of the wealth to himself. Like, and then, then he just from there, once he already had an objective view, he just kind of distributed it as most ethical. So, in terms of the war with Par Parthia, I'll go through this um, somewhat briefly because Marcus Aurelius, I don't, I think Lucius Verus actually did most of the work here, but I'll explain that in a second. So, Vologasus, uh, of Vologasis the fourth of Parthia invades the kingdom of Armenia. So at the time, the kingdom of Armenia was a, a Roman state. So essentially, the Parthians are invading Rome. And uh, additionally, they start invading into regions of Syria that have the Romans as well. So um, Marcus actually is very scared because despite his strong legal training, he was very fit for internal affairs. He was terrified as to what to do. He had no military training. Um, for some reason, um, Antonius sort of completely neglected this. Maybe it's because he, despite being interested in athletics, wasn't as interested in it either. Or maybe he saw that Marcus Aurelius and Lucius would have complementing features. Hard to say, but either way, Marcus goes on this uh, sort of vacation, like a four-day vacation, and he's... Um, uh, Pro Fronto is actually promoting this. He says, you know, you should go on a vacation and get relaxation, but he just couldn't sit still and sort of got back to work. So I think this is... Um, an important anecdote, and I, the reason why it's still talked about, is that it shows that he, despite his stoic philosophy, he could not give up his moral obligations. So he came back, and obviously he helped in the ultimate victory and the overthrow and the defeating of uh, Vologases. So in terms, also there was struggles in uh, Britain, uprisings there, and most notably Upper Germany. So they. He essentially, you if you've seen the, the movie Gladiator, they do slowly. I think you know they have uh, in the opening scene in Gladiator. You know he's in the carrot and stuff. He wasn't actually like fighting hand to hand because he was getting older at this time. But nonetheless, I think he helped win the war from a moral standpoint. I think the finances were going very strong at Rome. They were coming out of a of a, a recession, you can call. It, but he was and. He also, I think there was a great amount of morale amongst the soldiers. They all loved fighting for him. For example, when he first became emperor, he actually doubled their essential salary. So that was obviously a very good thing. And I think that the, um, they were very confident in fighting for him. And that's why they had these two victories. Not necessarily because Marcus Aurelius was great with the sword. In fact, I don't even know if he could hold a sword. So he wasn't exactly an Alexander the Great who would charge in and sort of lead by example. But he was sort of a he led in terms of um, inspiration as to what the greatness of Rome could be. They, yeah, so he's considered the most prudent emperor of all time, particularly because of his legal training. So his, the three things he was most interested in was the manumission of slaves. So this, I think, is because, I think this might be stretching it a bit, but he, I think, sort of, felt enslaved in his own role in that he wanted to just kind of study his philosophy, wear his robe, sleep on the floor, but he was thrust into this role. So obviously not slavery, but he understood what it meant to be sort of um, forced beyond one's own will. So I think that's why he sort of empathized with slaves and he put a lot of effort into helping them. But it was also, I think, just because he had a very um, social policy. He also thought that uh, the second issue he was most interested in was the guardianship of orphans. I think that's because, you know, his father died when he was three. He was kind of passed around, adopted by different people. Obviously, got adopted pretty lucky. Things turned out pretty well for him. But I think he understood 
what um, how isolated a child could feel and I think that's why he was so affectionate with Fronto because he never really had that fatherly figure and I think that's why he emphasized with the orphans. Lastly, he was very interested in the choice of city councillors, which is pretty obvious. I think it's that he, he believed that um, people should not be given things based on birthright, but by merit. And that's why he t thought one of his main tasks was just choosing these people, as he was chosen himself based on merit. Another example of how the they started a lot of trade, as mentioned, down in Asia. So this the Antonin plague broke out rooted from Mesopotamia and he helped keep everyone calm and sort of weathered that storm. Ultimately he died at 58 which is very young so good thing he got started at 26 but he was always sickly throughout his whole life so he was very much admired that he managed to still accomplish so much while having been so sickly all the time. He died in Vindabona which is modern day Vienna of natural causes and his son Commodus becomes emperor which is pretty much uh like that is the, the the tragedy or the the villain in gladiator and this is this is true um i think he really messed up in this regard see when um when uh the he was chosen to become or he was chosen not because of birthright he was chosen because of merit and in, in the movie Gladiator, he tries to get this other individual to become emperor, but they refuse. Maybe that was the case, but I've not seen anything actually um, backing that up. But I think he could have made a better effort at least to have maybe trained his son Commodus better or to maybe have found a better heir because I think it was a lot of lack of foresight. Maybe it's because his death was a bit unexpected, but nonetheless, um, not... It, Although he, he was the last, during his own lifetime, there was peace. After following him, Rome fell out of peace, and I think he could have done a much better job there. So moving to his actual philosophy, so that was a long biography. I think Marcus Aurelius could have almost been in the history, uh, ancient Greek and Roman history. The only reason I didn't was because he wasn't included in Plutarch's lives. So um, actually because he was um, too late, uh, Marcus Aurelius came too late. But nonetheless, the it, what he wrote this book called Meditations. So it didn't really have a real name. It was sort of just his own like diary, but it eventually got released. So it could also be referred to as to himself. It was written in Greek, as mentioned. It's divided into twelve books, and most of it is just kind of one sentence mantras and paragraphs. And it's very simple in terms of writing, which is um, par uh, I think parallel to the Stoic philosophy and it's mo mostly on self-judgment and cosmic perspectives so basically avoid sensory perceptions and affections and um, never allow reaction to overpower they must r rise above things out of your control such as health and fame so i think the best way to actually understand this is firstly get a copy for yourself i don't actually have it here because i'm not um, I don't have all my books with me, but it's nice to have a little copy. Obviously, don't read it like it's like it's absolutely the truth, because they're all sort of one-sided mantras. It might be might be true. It might sound nice, but it might not be applicable in every situation. So, nonetheless, I'm gonna I wrote down some quotes here, some of my favorites, just so we can get a feel for how it sounds. Now, obviously, it would be in Greek, but um, and sort of his overall message. If thou art pained by any external thing, it is not this that disturbs thee but thy own judgment about it, and it is in thy power to wipe out this judgment now. So once again, um, very stoic thing is that to reach salvation, it's not the external thing, it's what's within, and it's also the difference between perception and what is the actual essence of the thing, right? So you might, for example, be uh, jealous for example you're and you're mad at this person because they've got something that you don't but the the issue is actually yourself you could improve yourself and eradicate that they say like for example if you want to build the tallest building in the city there are two ways you can either build the tallest building or you could break down someone else's building so obviously you're supposed to build up your own uh, another one a cucumber is bitter throw it away there are briars on the road that's like it's like a prickly plant turn aside for them this is enough do not add 
and why were such things made in the world. So obviously there are bad things. Um, he did, obviously was not a cucumber lover, but there are spiky things. There are things that taste bad. Don't like complain. Don't don't uh, let it get to you. Don't don't question why the world is evil and spiky. Just ignore it. Just only include the good things in your life. So I think that's a nice one. Not to feel exasperated or defeated or despondent because your days aren't packed with wise and moral actions, but to get back up when you fail, to celebrate behaving like a human, however imperfectly and fully embrace the pursuit you've embarked on. So not to delve on the little things, not to, you know, people mess up, um, focus on the long-term goals. Uh, another quote I don't have here, but to sort of paraphrase it, is that history is remembered in a day and written in a day so um, any of these anecdotes that these are really for example when i i mentioned a a story about marcus aurelius i'm talking about one specific day he might have had a day of greatness but followed by five days of depression um a day that wasn't packed with wise and moral actions marcus aurelius achieved great things but that doesn't mean every one of his days were perfect the stories that we have were probably could be counted in a dozen, a dozen days out of his whole life. He only lived to 58, but only a, like a dozen days were actually significant. So don't, if you have a bad day, that doesn't mean you won't have an amazing, great day that will change the world and make you remembered forever. So I think that's a very nice one. And lastly, my favorite one, put an end once and for all to this discussion of what a good man should be and be one. So I think this is at the end of the day the probably the i don't know one of the best quotes i've heard in that you know you can you can study all these philosophers all day you can learn every single thing about stoicism you can live stoicism um but at the end of the day i think everyone kind of knows what it what it means to be good and i think the answer is sort of um sort of an internal thing and you can be good today like you can all you got to do is like just, just smile so yeah that is Marcus Aurelius. We'll get more to him in the comparison. So Plotinus. So he's considered a Neoplatonist, which was actually a term that came way later, but the, essentially that's how he's been characterized. And he's pretty much, I, I think you could call him the first Neoplatonist. So 204 AD to 270 AD, there's a bit of a gap here between Plotinus and Marcus Aurelius. There are a few individuals in between here, but many of them are Stoics, so it's starting to get a bit redundant. Um, I might go back and include them if any, but they're, they would have been too short, so I wanted to jump to something that would actually be big and substantial. So he's a, uh, he was born in Egypt, so there's actually not much written about his early life. Even his own writings were ultimately written by one of his students and they were messy and he wasn't really good at uh, keeping this information. So basically people don't know if he was actually of Egyptian descent, Hellenized Egyptian descent, Roman descent, Greek. Um, I guess you could look at the statue but you can't really derive it. He looks he looks pretty Roman to me but like it's it's hard to tell especially considering his nose is broken. Um, I was gonna make a... I, I, I had this joke before. I, I broke my nose. It's all now. It's pretty fixed now. It's still got a bit of swelling, but I was really like I was really upset about this. I thought you know I'll never be pretty pretty again. But then I I, I, I realized all these people who I admire most of all, they don't like it, it, their noses are like well obviously because the statues got taken off, but their their image really had nothing to do with their influence even their lasting influence like do you think any any fewer people are gonna read and study Plotinus because there's this big gash in his nose or something like that um, no so appearance is not that important but I guess two individuals before going into this I want to mention uh, notable mentions are Gaius Masonius Rufus he was um, the word the name Gaius I actually really like because it's actually like CAI it's like my first name and it was actually G and C were the same, so it's Caius. It's kind of like my own name. It's the second most popular Roman name. But anyways, he was a famous Stoic under Nero, and he was famous for, you know, wearing a robe and really bringing the Greek traditions to uh, Rome. He would never shave and that sort of thing, so very ascetic life. And Clement of Alexandria, so he was one of the... He was influenced by the Stoics, and he sort of was one of the first to sort of 
where they start publicizing the Christian religion. So obviously the, the Bible was written, but it took a long time before it actually really hit off. And Clement was very important in that. So also one who was very useful in, in studying. So he's, he was, he, Pl Plotinus was known for uh, distrust in materiality. And this is kind of like a, a cynic perspective. So he's almost going backwards in terms of Stoicism were more okay with possessions and the cynics were completely against it. So he's kind of moving a step back here. He even refused to have paintings done of him because he thought that, well, actually he thought that an, a beautiful person is a manifestation of their internal beauty was something he believed, but he thought that to paint it was to get further from the actual beauty or an, further from an abstract. Uh, further from the one as we'll very soon see so he didn't start philosophy until 27 so this is this is pretty crazy because you know at 26 Marcus Aurelius was already assuming um, Emperor like roles whereas Plotinus was a bit of a more of a late bloomer didn't even start studying philosophy until 27 and this was when he was in Alexandria and he first wasn't really impressed with any of the philosophers until he met this individual named Ammonius and he said this is the man I've been looking for and Ammonius was um, a student or not he didn't actually know Plato but he followed the Platonic uh, philosophy and he also um, has um, Plotonius that is also had many Stoic influences as well so at 38, he traveled down to India and Persia, mostly with the objective of learning, but he did, did so through campaigns. So he actually joined Gordian III's campaign down there, but he ultimately was abandoned. <laughs> so they, they lost the war and he was abandoned, so he had to make his way back up. But I think his, his philosophies could be very, um, a lot of, especially his lifestyle, his ascetic lifestyle, could see a lot of parallels to the Eastern religions, Mahavira, and Buddha, for example, but also Greeks, Pythagoras, and pretty much it almost seems to be a parallel between all these philosophers that asceticism was very popular. It's pretty much all these philosophers up until we see Adam Smith believed in this, and we will discuss Adam Smith. So at 40, he goes to Rome, and he gets uh, very, very, he starts school, he gets a lot of students, many are senators, doctors, and important people, and eventually, Emperor Gallius um, becomes very fond of him, and that ultimately gets his fame. And that's what I think. I think it's a. I, I, it's hard to say whether he would have been famous without the endorsement, or he was so good that he got the endorsement. Either way, it's important. It's important to note. But he actually asked of the emperor. There was this this destroyed. Um, region called Campania, and he actually had an estate there where he ultimately um, lives the remainder of his life. But it was a destroyed settlement, and he wanted to establish a city of philosophers, so he wanted to establish a little, his own state with Platonic laws, sort of a, an ideal state. But obviously this was refused, and I think it might be seen as a bit, like obviously it's possible, but I think it's a bit, um, um, idealistic to just create a state and assume everything work out as like a, a state is kind of it, I, I don't think it can just be created just like you can't just create life you know it's sort of uh, states are kind of moving and adapting things combining and breaking apart I think it would be hard to just sort of create one but who knows there, um, there are talks Peter Thiel mentioned um, in one of his interviews they're thinking of building these new states on little islands, man-made islands, where they've got completely different laws, and that would be a cool uh, thought experiment. So some of his quotes are, try to raise the divine in yourself to the divine in all. So he believed in what's called the one. So very much similar to some of our earliest philosophers where, um, you know, they thought of, or just sort of, what is the god and he thought that it was sort of i guess one cannot be any existing thing one being the one which is like the god but it's not even it's it's not physical it's not even non-being it's not even non-physical it's just everything but it is prior to all existence so once you've uttered so it can be classified as two things it is the good and it is the beauty so if you 
for example, beauty is, an, is a closer approximation to the one, but also the good. And uh, an explanation like this to um, really flesh it out is, once you have uttered the good, add no further thought. By any addition, and in proportion to that addition, you introduce a deficiency. So even me trying to explain it by his definition fails to do so. So for example, if you say the good is benevolent, um, that is already sort of trimming it down. The good is just good. It is, there's, there's nothing more to explain it. It's absolute purity. And he sort of saw that everything sort of moves. So first comes the one, then comes the soul, then comes our physical body. So our physical body is less good, less pure than our soul, for example. And here's a, a quote on beauty also. So beauty is also representative of the good. So being is desirable because it is identical with beauty. And beauty is love because it is being. We ourselves possess beauty when we are true to our own being. Ugliness is in going over to another order. Knowing ourselves, we are beautiful. In self-ignorance, we are ugly. So I don't know how literal to take this, but I do think that for to some extent, people's appearance is a manifestation of who, who what, like what's going on under the skin. But also at the same time, I think that, you know, your external appearance might also influence how you're feeling as well. So I, I don't, I don't think this should be taken too literal. This doesn't mean that, for example, an ugly person is um, is evil or not in touch with their soul, but um, it's it's. It, I think he's referring to a different kind of a different kind of beauty. Um, let's see. There exists no single human being that does not either potentially or effectively possess this thing that we hold to constitute happiness. So that is, I guess, an explanation of that. So even an ugly person, he might advocate that they are further from the good, but they still have the capacity for happiness. And true, in terms of true human happiness, the he was one of the first to advocate for eudaimonia, which is essentially like free from suffering is, or just eudaimonia is like a state of happiness. Um, they, he, he thought that he was one of the first to say that it can only come from an internal source. He thought that a true um, follower, or the proficient he calls it, would be one who, if they were subjected to physical torture, they wouldn't even feel it because they would be so um, in touch with their own soul, and that was really the most important thing. Lastly, henosis, which is considered a blank state with the one. So the more we think, so it's also kind of divergent from a lot of other philosophers. It's kind of like a state of meditation where one completely blanks their state and they'll get closer to the one. So once again, this state of meditation also is very similar to Mahavira and Buddha who sort of tried to, you know, for example, in the case of Mahavira, you know, starve yourself, clean your slate, and you, then you'll get the spiritual awakening. Ignore the pain. The Pythagoreans practice certain things like that as well. Um, I think it's, it's an important exercise, I think, in every single major religion. And as we're even seeing, like, this guy's not even um, necessarily from a religious text. He also advocates for fasting. Every single religion advocates for fasting in some sense. But I think fasting is just an an example of some kind of it's the most simple type of sacrifice you can make or the most because obviously like yeah i think it's just the most simple example of of achieving enlightenment or of sort of avoiding pleasure so Basically, his philosophy is divided into three main principles. There's the one, which is basically the good, and the more I try to explain it, the more I'm digging myself a hole, my own hole in terms of Plotinus's terms. There's the intellect, which is the new. So even though he believed in this henosis, which is a blank state, achieving more intellect will get, um, get you closer to the one. So it's kind of a kind of a paradox there, like. You have to learn lots, and then when the time comes, blank your state, slate. And lastly, the soul, which is sort of the soul precedes the body. And yeah, so that's basically 
Plutonius in terms of the comparison between the two. So Marcus Aurelius sort of did his own work for uh, inter completely internal reasons. Like he wrote his meditations for himself. And he just sort of, the way he taught people is just sort of by manifesting his stoic beliefs, but he never specifically instructed people. Whereas Plutonius actually had students, he even sort of taught one of the emperors, and he was sort of more, sort of more pushing his agenda. But maybe he had to push harder because Marcus Aurelius was already emperor, like he doesn't really have to push too hard to get people to, to get influence. There, in terms of why they did it, I think Mark, or why they sort of uh, pursued their lives, Marcus Aurelius sort of did it. Um, pursued his career because he felt morally obligated so he wasn't really becoming emperor and doing these great things for the people because he wanted to if I think he could have had his own way he would have lived a simple life but then again he never really turned up the opportunity like he never there's no he never completely ran away from it he went on that little vacation but whereas Plutonius once again was really internally driven obviously it came later but he really pushed himself in his own right in terms of also their writing, you know, Marcus Aurelius wrote it for himself, but also Plutonius, I didn't mention this before, so he wrote these, all of his um, writings down, and his student, Porphyry, um, like, he, Plutonius was horrible at editing, and his writing was super poor, so Porphyry had a hard time recreating it, but nonetheless, he did it and pulled it off, but I think this might be a little bit... Um, uh, um, harsh, but I, I, I have a, uh, I don't have as much respect for people with, with like big writing. I think it's kind of like, I get, I understand if they like don't have proper hand control or something like this, but every word is of independently of equal value, right? So if you use the word like hate and you write a big hate, it's still the same thing. But what it's the combination of words that have more value. So if you have two words, it's obviously, it's not even twice as valuable having two words because they also complement each other. Three words, it's exponential, the more words you have. So if you write smaller as well, you can have more words per section. And I, I just also think it, it's just a sign of better character. I think kind of in the, in the sense of Marcus Aurelius, he wrote his stuff sort of for himself, like he wasn't trying to write it in charming terms, he wasn't trying to persuade everyone, he was just trying to do it in his own life, for his own um, self-gain. Like here's an example of my writing, I write extremely small, when I was younger I used to write like very big fonts, um, I think part of it was just my hand was too weak, but when I started writing small, that's when I got sort of passionate about writing things, and it also felt when I was writing small, I was quite, kind of... I was writing it for myself. I wasn't writing it for someone else. And I think there was a big distinction there. So I don't think that's very admirable on Plutonius. But, you know, maybe maybe he just couldn't really control his pen. Or maybe he... But it's also said that he, like, wouldn't space his words out. Maybe he suffered some something. But I don't know. I don't think that was particularly great in his respect. But nonetheless, these two are both very individu important individuals. Plutonius, he used the example for God as like the sun in that its rays are indiscriminate. So, and many of, and it, um, obviously this is wrong now, but it was endless in terms of source. So the analogy of saying the sun is like the God is like, has been used many times in the future. So pretty important influence on both respects. Plutonius actually has a big influence on even pagan religions because his parents were pagan and then he sort of uh, switched over but he's to his own sort of philosophy but he's had an influence on pretty much every religion and he's probably considered the first of the neoplatonists so and we'll probably talk about some more of them in the future so thank you so much for watching this video on marcus Aurelius and plutonius i hope you watch some of the ones i make in the future and some of the ones in the past so thanks so much bye